This week, we are happy to re-announce that our book is coming out. Um, and we have recently spoken to Wanjira Matai. Who features on this very episode. But we have actually asked for her permission to dedicate the proceeds that would normally have come to the authors to actually uh, the Green Belt Movement because it is one of the longest standing and most reputable tree planting exercises. And tree planting uh, plays a very important role in part three of our book where we put out the 10 actions that we need to implement or enact uh, in order to bring about a regenerated planet. So if you buy a book between now and the 25th, we choose the future.com you have to go to. You can click there th through from there to every retailer that currently allows you to pre-order it, buy it before the 25th of February and all the proceeds that would have come to us will go to the Greenbelt movement. All right, here's the episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Outrage and Optimism. My name's Tom Riffick Karnak. I'm Christiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we speak about the recent decision by the European Investment Bank to stop funding fossil fuels. We delve in to a recent announcement of psychology professionals from 40 countries to announce their intention to deal with climate change. And Paul talks about his recent trip to the Magic Kingdom. Plus, we speak to Wanjira Matai, head of the Wangari Matai Foundation. Thanks for being here. Right, so it's been a nice couple of weeks. Good stuff happening all around the world. A few things to be outraged by. Let's dig into it. Christiana, how are you doing? Well, I am very uh, joyous and relieved that the European Investment Bank has finally taken a very important decision that kept on toing and froing. European um, Investment Bank being one of the most important financial institutions in the world, right? Yes, well, yeah. definitely in Europe, definitely for in Europe. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also in the world. And so they have finally, after um, much discussion at the board level, they have finally decided to stop funding fossil fuels in general. And that includes uh, actually not only solid fossil fuels, but also liquid and gas fossil fuels um, by the year 2021. They were wow. originally trying to do it by 2020, but the countries that were concerned uh, put some pressure. So the final resolution was to stop funding fossil fuels in 2021. And, uh, you know, they, they're they actually getting in line with so many other both development banks and private banks that are reaching the same conclusion, which is that high carbon assets are just too risky for the economic stability of the planet for them to continue to invest there. And this comes actually hand in hand with the announcement uh, that we now have the first steel furnace that is operating on 100% renewable hydrogen. Oh, that where is, is that? just so amazing, right? That is Germany. It's uh, the company ThyssenKrupp, a uh, very, very large steel company. And it is so exciting because it really punctures the myth that all of these very um, energy intensive industries can only proceed with coal. And um, and this really punctures the myth because they have been at it for quite a while, and the um, the steel blast furnace is now running on 100% renewable hydrogen, and actually doing quite well. So stay tuned. We will see how this is. It's definitely in the in the ledger of experiments. It's definitely not mainstream yet. So is that but commercially it, viable to do that? I mean, apparently, apparently it is. So. And apparently that would be it is. not zero carbon, but close to zero carbon steel. I mean, you'd have to dig something out of the ground, but that's amazing. Well, it, it really is. And, and what it does for these hard to abate sectors, right? Yeah. Because we have, we have separated out some sectors such as steel, cement, iron. Um, and we have said all of those sectors are very, very hard to decarbonize. And this is the first time that one plant in one of those sectors is actually running on hydrogen. So um, stay, you know, stay, stay tuned. This could really begin to erode the need for coal. And, and it's amazing that they, you know, I mean, obviously for a long time, 
it actually doesn't feel like that long ago that like all the multilateral development banks and the bilateral development banks were kind of struggling with how on earth do they stop financing coal? You know, and it, it was only a few years ago, I think, that the World Bank completely stopped doing that. And now the, the European Investment Bank is now saying we're not going to fund fossil fuels at all actually plays a kind of outsized role, probably more than maybe some listeners might realise, in making it much more difficult to finance new fossil fuel facilities that require huge amounts of capital, some of which has to come from institutions like the EIB that will provide some sort of concessional capital, make it cheaper for them to do it. So without that, that's going to be an amazing impact, actually. Cool. Paul? Well, I'm very optimistic about something I wanted to share. It's a little bit personal, but it's what you refer to as the Magic Kingdom. And it is, in fact, uh, a nickname I think Christiana came up with for uh, an intentional community in the north of Scotland called the Fintorn Foundation, which has just celebrated its 57th birthday. I've had the enormous honour to be a trustee of the community for, uh, I think, about eight years and uh, have been organising events there since 2002. And I just wanted to share something within the context of the uh, conversation with Joanna Macy last week where we were talking about people being kind of connected to each other, to the world. Um, that's something that the founders of Fintorn and, and, and the community there, which is very diverse and without, uh, without any kind of, uh, you know, re religious uh, unity or anything like that. But concepts like co-creation with nature and, and particularly listening to yourself, listening to your inner voice, there are places where people will meditate and just kind of listen to themselves. And that's, that's, the, that's the sort of entreaty and, and believing that there's a sort of intelligence of nature that we can kind of better understand. What I've found very exciting actually working with, with a friend of mine, also Helen Wildsmith and, and many others, has been to see how groups of professionals meet in Fintorn uh, to discuss sustainability issues. Actually, many institutional investors get together and uh, their associations sit in a circle uh, with a candle, have a good facilitated discussion in a sort of non-hierarchical way. And we make great breakthroughs in terms of, of thinking about how finance can respond to sustainability, how, how, how we all can respond to sustainability, and also to build networks of support and, and to have a different kind of conversation in a different kind of space. Because when you're trying to imagine a kind of new world, it helps to be in somewhere that looks and feels very different. It, it liberates a sense of the possible. So just back from a four-day trustees meeting in, in Fintorn, I was so um, so sort of full of the joy of, of, of people uh, living in a different way. I just wanted to share that with our audience. Did you say a four-day trustee meeting? Yeah, it's kind right, of okay. funny, right? right. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I work full-time in the charity, as you know, and um, essentially the formal governance of our, our, our charity is conducted in Eight hours a year, and right. uh, a Fintorn trustees meeting is uh, four, four days. days. <laughs> <laughs> and those happen what monthly or? Uh, um, yeah. no, luckily, they happen only twice a year. But uh, it's a completely different way of, uh, you know, getting together, introducing each other, getting to know where everyone is, yeah. sitting in silence, and then beginning to raise the issues. A nice. very different way of going about business. And I have to say, I've come to a few of your events at Fintorn um, prior to 2015, and then and then after as well mainly with um, some, you know, really quite senior people in the finance sector, actually, and we'd all sort of sit together for two or three days and kind of figure out a strategy for a particular thing. And, you know, they've been amazing. I've really enjoyed them. But the thing that I was going to comment on is I always, because, you know, not having the best memory in the world, I can't always remember where I know someone from, but I always know when I meet someone that I met at Fintorn because wherever I am, you know, suit on, big financial conference, they'll come up and give me a big hug, <laughs> you know, which is absolutely fantastic. I love it. Very subversive. Well, that applies to both of you Brits, right? Because we <laughs> Costa Ricans, <laughs> we always hug and kiss. Yeah, that's uh, like something that is uh, quite atypical for you, but totally typical for us. Um, and um, Paul, I, I was going to invite you to um, comment a little bit further about food at Finhorn. Yeah, so the, the Fintorn Foundation has a large and beautiful community centre where, you know, anywhere between 20 or, or, or 150 people plus, actually, will, will eat uh, together. And the food is vegetarian food, of which about 60% is grown in the fairly large Fintorn Gardens. And um, uh, it's just a, a wonderful to be able to actually... Um, 
eat together delicious vegetarian food and actually to know that it's been grown nearby. And actually, we were on a course once on uh, sustainable finance and uh, Professor Nick Robbins of the London School of Economics said, right, that's it. We've got to work in the garden tomorrow morning. And we made some inquiries and it was possible. And we we ended up working in a polytunnel uh, the next morning, which is a way to have a different sort of conversation. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to bring something this week. And, and honestly, I don't really know whether I'm outraged or optimistic by it. I think it sort of falls somewhere in between. Um, because it is um, the outcome of a conference that happened this week, uh, or last week, actually, in Portugal. And it was the gathering of the National Confederations and Associations of Psychology. So 40 countries around the world, all of the national associations went there. And they signed a collective statement, a draft, a resolution to talk about the fact that they have a unique and important role in dealing with the climate crisis in two ways. One is that people are really struggling now to deal with what it means to live through this period of loss and how they can come to terms with that and still live full and emotionally healthy lives. And they made a commitment to work to address that and to understand that in a deeper way to help people. And the other part of it was understanding that some of the reasons why people don't take action on climate change is to do with psychological reasons, things that make it more challenging for them to face a certain reality, how that translates into particular kinds of action. So all of these different national institutions signed a resolution which commits them to facing these two different issues to try and help people both address the issue and understand it and also live healthy lives in the context of it which i mean now that i've told you about it i feel much more optimistic than outraged about it and actually i think it was great it's kind of sad that it was needed but i think it's fantastic well i have i have a similar shift from outrage to optimism about it something completely different to what both of you have just um i've just shared with us and that is um, the fires in australia have really been dominating the news uh now for weeks because they are completely unprecedented fires, came very, very close to Sydney and have really just left, you know, destruction and pain in in, in their wake. Um, 20-something former fire chiefs of Australia have come out to say that they all understand that this is not caused by, but that this is exacerbated by climate change. And they have been calling on the government to actually be better prepared and to have better policy. But the current government has been particularly uh, deaf to their calls. Well, the reason why uh, I am actually have a smile on my face this morning is because the Swedish central bank has decided to sell off the Australian bonds that it was holding. <laughs> and the reason for that is it's just too risky. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's very interesting this when the Dude, next... These are Australian government bonds. bonds. Wow. Yeah, they're wow. just selling them off because the Australian government does not have responsible climate change policy. And hence those bonds are too risky uh, in the medium and long term as asset you know, asset holders. So um I think it's uh I think it's quite um exciting to see how monetary policy is really changing and how monetary policy in this case by a central bank, but we know we have more than 40 central banks looking at uh, at the effect of climate on monetary policy through the network for greening uh, finance. It's very, um, it, it's exciting. It's not going fast enough, but it is going where it needs to go, right? Right to the, to the heart of decision-making and of awareness of central banks. Fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. And I mean, God, you can sort of anticipate, given that these things tend to go very slowly and then very fast and what Mark Carney said to us the other week, and then, you know, Sweden selling off its Australian bonds. I mean, how long will it be till Australia does a bond issuance and doesn't find any buyers, you know, or has to then end up paying more and more to, to borrow the money? That's going to change a lot of things. Right, so this week we have a wonderful uh, opportunity to speak with um, a wonderful human being, Wanjira Matai. Christiana, why don't you introduce Wanjira, because you know her better than any of us. Well, Wanjira is a fantastic woman um, in her own right. 
uh, those those who have had the privilege of, uh, of of meeting her know that she's a bundle of energy. She has the fantastic laugh, a smile. You know, even I'm sure that she smiles even in her sleep uh, because she's just always so positive and uh, and so committed. And uh, it's it's difficult, I'm sure, to stray very far from uh, from your original DNA. Uh, her original DNA is uh, her mother, um, Wangari Matai, who was the founder of the Green Belt Movement and who started this amazing planting tree movement in all of Africa. Uh, won, in, a, won a prize for it, didn't she? And she won the Nobel Peace Prize right. for that. Yeah, yeah, a little detail. Right, right. <laughs> um, and, and she did it because she understood the relationship between nature and regenerating nature, regenerating the soil and the quality of human life uh, that would ensue around those areas of, uh, of replanted, uh, replanted lands. Uh, and, uh, and, and when, when Jira continues to have that passion and has added on top of that another passion, which is to really uh, get to the core and to the, to the bottom of corruption. Uh, a very, very courageous stand, a very courageous movement, particularly in uh, geographical areas in which this is honestly, it's a pretty dangerous activity to, to be engaged in. So, you know, all the way from planting trees to having more transparency on decisions. This is just a fabulous woman. Amazing. All right, let's talk to her. Well, Jira, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you coming on Outrage and Optimism. Um, we've called this podcast Outrage and Optimism because we think that both of those human impulses are going to be necessary right now to move us to where we need to go. We think that the optimism of smart policy, of new ideas about the future of technology is a huge part of what we need to do. And we think we need to marry that with the outrage that we're seeing on the streets and that energy that is now coming from people who realize that we're not going in the direction we want to. Um, so we're delighted to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Maybe we could kick off by you just um, say introduce yourself in a few words around your current work and what's what you're passionate about at the moment, and we'll go from there. Well, I love outrage and optimism. Mm. It works. It actually does. <laughs> well, my name is Wanjiro Mathai, as you said. I am the executive chair of the Wangari Mathai Foundation, which is a legacy organization to my mother, who was a dear friend of Christiana's. And uh, my late mother was a great inspiration to me. I consider myself deeply fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with her for 12 years and and to look over her shoulder almost every day, be responsible for co-creating things with her and thinking with her. So often people say, um, how does it feel to try and feel her shoes? And I tell people, oh my goodness, I hardly have to feel her shoes. I just have to bask in her sunlight. <laughs> and, and, so and wear I, your own I, shoes. And wear my own shoes in the process. And that's really where I feel I'm, I'm one of the things as a result of that, that, that um, has really deepened my passion and really I consider my moment of obligation is the fact that the story of Wangari Mathai's life and um, work is still relevant today. Absolutely. Um, and I think in particular for young people. I think the work of the Green Belt Movement uh, brought to the fore how important environmental conservation is and how important um, grassroots uh, uh, solidarity is in, in our work. But one of the things that I felt was missing when I, when I quietly was reflecting on, so then what now? after my mother passed and the Green Belt Movement stabilized a little bit, I realized we have not quite unpacked um, my mother's legacy to young people. What mm -hmm. does it mean, Wangari Mathai's life and work to young people today and children? And so the Wangari Mathai Foundation, I tell people, is about who she was. The Greenbelt Movement is really what she did. And so my passion right now, what I'm concerned about, is building a culture of purpose and integrity that fosters uh, courageous leadership because that's really what we need today. And that's who she was. And that's who she was. Who she still is, actually. And she's who she still, she still is. is. I so believe that. <laughs> it, she's always checking in on us and, and making sure we are, we are in line. But yeah, that's where I am right now. Well, I think we would, um, 
love to talk about two things, perhaps. Um, one is um, that legacy of um, bottom-up responsibility and participation that your mother uh, was so instrumental in seeding way beyond, way beyond her time, right? Way, way, way before her time. Because the fact is that we are now finally coming around to realizing uh, that much of the transformation that is needed is bottom up in addition to top down, but it's always somehow easier to think about top down. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and bottom up is honestly much more difficult because it's so much more granular, it's so much more dissipated, it's so much more decentralized. And, um, and your mother and your work has been there from the beginning. So what, what does it feel like to, um, to have the world now finally realize that you were right? <laughs> I know. It must be satisfying, I must say. It, you, you, you sometimes hope. And one of the things that my mother always said is, um, and I was really young when she would use the word public opinion notwithstanding. And I wasn't sure, was that one word, two words, three <laughs> words, and what did it mean? But the, the, as I got older, it was like, just focus on what you believe to be true. It really doesn't matter what other people think. If you're yeah. focused, if you're convicted, go for it. And then sometimes you will be proven right and you can celebrate. And sometimes you might even be wrong. And it's how you navigate around that. But I, I really love that disposition because mm. it allows you not to worry too much. I am actually a sort of what do the neighbors think kind of person. And I, I did, I get overwhelmed sometimes with being cautious and being a little bit careful. But I've, I've learned that you really have to plow through if you believe it. If you, and the more I've read about peop, different people, different leaders, women leaders, they really are gut driven. They, they know this to be true and they just plow through. So mm. I really love um, that perspective. And so I think when you find out you're right, it is incredibly satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, and in that, um, in that context, uh, I just always found so inspiring the deep connection that both of you have had always between women, women empowerment, we finding out who we are and what our role is on this planet. Um, and then the planting of trees, right? Because one is just very philosophical, psychological, sort of taking a look into our souls. And the other one is just doing what needs to be done. Put a seed into the ground, put a sapling into the ground. And I just find that combination so powerful and you continue to do it. And, you know, if you can render that to anything, it, it works, whether you're baking or you're solving climate and, and helping bring about climate accords. It, it is the same sort of, so what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Because the, the end is not negotiable. We've got to get there. And so I think that is very much a feminist um, perspective because mm -hmm. there is no discussion about whether we're going to get, the children have to eat. And so right. we've got to find, yeah, so we walk five hours to get the water. Let's walk five hours to get mm -hmm. the water. What else are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I think there's, th there's that which has really been part of the resilience of, and the solidarity of the women's movement is there's this feeling of let's get it done. So what, do you want me to walk on my head? I'll walk on my head. Mm -hmm. That's what you need us to do so that we get there. Yeah. We'll get there. And that's so important today that we don't give up. That I remember being told giving up is not an option. So exactly. what are you going to do? How yeah. do we plow through? It's not whether we can. It's just how are we going to do, do it? How are we going to do it? And there's something in there that I think that has always been so inspiring about the Greenbelt Movement and I think is now being picked up around the world that sustainability never really caught the imagination of the world. This sort of idea that if we work hard, we can maintain things kind of as they are. And the Greenbelt movement, which then led to this sense of regeneration, that we can make this planet more beautiful, we can bring back the biodiversity, is now what's spreading around the world. And it's, I wonder whether what you think about that, as Christiana asked earlier, and whether you feel that will be an inflection point that enables us to go further as those concepts shift. What I think about the, the idea of sustainability. Well, the idea that, the, I mean, what we're seeing is the concept of sustainability is shifting yeah. to the idea of regeneration. And I think that that's much easier to get excited about. I think so. But for me, I th I've always considered the fact that sustainability is really about 
the interconnectedness mm. of different issues. So it, it, it may shift as we add more issues. I think the Nobel Peace Prize for me was always a really interesting perspective on what it means for things to be interconnected, that the environment, democracy, and peace mm. are centrally, inextricably linked. Exactly. How, how is that possible? And that you cannot have sustainable development if you don't have uh, a healthy environment. You cannot have sustainable development if you don't have peace, yes. if you don't have a de democratic space. Yeah. And so all of these linkages, to me, helped unpack sustainability, which, yeah, has been loaded and even cliché. But now I feel it's really about how connected things are. So when someone says sustainability, I see a web. Hmm. I immediately see a web of just different things. And the more we discover some of the new connections, we call them new names, but it's still that web. It's about the connections. Yeah. Yeah. Could we shift for a second to another topic um, that is... Um, a topic that you're passionate about and very eloquent and very knowledgeable about. And it is actually a tragic topic, right? Corruption. Yeah. Um, and you, the, probably there is no one who has studied that uh, in depth, at least in Kenya, as you have. Um, I would love to know why did you start getting into that? Um, and what have you found out? Well, corruption is, is an interesting um, vice because it is, for me, I, I came into it just because I'm frustrated. Because it it festers, it it's toxic, as I say, and it renders almost everything hopeless and useless. You have crime of untold proportions. The climate crisis is largely due to corruption and greed. Mm. And one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I hope Gus Speth said this, because <laughs> I use it <laughs> all the time. <laughs> because I heard that Gus said that I thought the greatest environmental challenges were climate change, ecosystem collapse, and biodiversity loss. I was wrong. The greatest environmental challenge is greed, mm. selfishness, and apathy, wow. because at the core of those th three things, that is definition is the definition of corruption. And to think that there is a fundamental connection between most of the challenges that we face today, name it, with corruption and greed, for me was fundamentally um, arresting. Mm. And as we were thinking about what to do with the Wangari Mathai Foundation, we were very clear that the legacy would be to young people. But what would be the focus of this work? Mm -hmm. uh, almost prophetically, the East African Institute at the, at the Aga Khan University in Nairobi released a survey on East African youth. And about the youth, we learned this. First of all, 80% of Kenya's population is under the age of 35. 80%? 80%. Wow. percent and you know that by 2050, over half of the continent of Africa will be under the age of 25. So look at that demographic of young people on that continent. Mm. I call the heart of the globe. They are an extremely young population. But these were their uh, perspectives and their values in, in, the, in this survey. 58% of those in Kenya said they would be willing to do anything for money. 45 said corruption is a legitimate tool for business. Wow. It is a tool for doing business. And 73% of them in a country that produced Wangari Mathai said, that Wangari Mathai is the woman they most admire. She was the highest in their ranking. But 73% of them said they would not be willing to stand up for what they believe. Whoa. For fear. Wow of retribution. We knew immediately that that would be the focus of the Wangai Mathai Foundation's mm -hmm. work, to begin to work with youth to unpack where this courage deficit is coming from, yeah. where this integrity deficit is coming from. And in fact, that it's manifesting all across every sector, from education to finance, high government offices, the lowest grassroots uh, collectives, corruption is a legitimate tool for doing business. We have got to shift this culture. It is slow and deep work, mm. but it can be done is part of our thinking. And I, I really believe sometimes that you have to think of things as 
it's a big issue. Corruption is so big, we have to address it. So it's not something that we shy and away from. And not many people want to. And not yeah. many people want to deal with it. But I and and maybe the way we are dealing with it is a little bit um, benign because we're saying we've got to work with kids in schools, we've got to work with young people to deliberately nurture character and mm. personal leadership. We say we've got to offer these. Um, experiences so young people know how to call out corruption how to use their voices for positive causes from really early on what does it mean to have a growth mindset to have self-confidence yeah. so that all of these and what we're calling them are character traits we identified eight character traits that were who Wangari Mathai was and then we said, let's code these. Sh share us traits. what those eight are. Some are, I hope I can name them all. I often can't. Courage and confidence mm -hmm. is one set. Integrity and honesty. Um, commitment to excellence. Service to others. Mm -hmm. Resilience. Creativity and resourcefulness. Now we are the other two. <laughs> but those sorts of Already things. Already a beautiful universe. Yeah. Yes. And, and that these were things that... We unpacked from her own memoirs. We read together mm -hmm. and we thought, th here it is. Ongari Mathai always said, use what's around you. Ah, she was very resourceful. And in fact, we must always look to solve the problems our communities are facing today. I tell young people today, chasing money is not a problem in and of itself. It's how. When you're willing to do anything, to make money, that's problematic. Mm. But if you look around your community and you find there's a problem and you come up with a solution that makes and you, you money, make money in the process, good on you. Very good. hooray! Yes. And that we must have that kind of motivation yeah. for making money. And when you ask them who they admire, they talk about Mark Zuckerberg, they talk about Bill Gates. And I tell them, these guys created something. And right. if you don't create and fill a gap, that people are willing to pay for, then you have to steal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to work. That, that concept of a courage deficit, I think, is amazing. And I think it speaks to so much that goes on around the world that yeah. we need to address. What, what have you found in terms of, so two questions, I suppose. One is, do you know if that's changed over time? Has it become more or less, the deficit? And also, what are you finding or what's the plan to help people build that courage? So we, we're just getting started. Four years old is this foundation, yeah. but we are so bullish. It's uh, that we know that if we can, the courage deficit is about how do you get people to be confident enough? Mm. We're starting to see youth confidence. I mean, this is yes. uh, happening quite a bit. Yesterday yeah. was, or was it the day before? It was remarkable yes. in the climate marches. I was in well, Pittsburgh. The, the march was on Friday, yeah, on Friday, and then Saturday was the um, summit of yes. the youth. Then you, so, for the first time, you have youth voices being mm. heard in ways we've never seen before. Mm. Yes. Greta is just galvanizing all of us and opening our eyes in ways that we, she's not saying anything new, mm. but she represents a force that is going to be impossible to subdue. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there's something going on with that and the courage that it's inflicting on other young people. That's the sort of courage. Because if we begin, what does courage look like for a 10-year-old? Because those 10-year-olds are the ones we are working with first. In fact, we're being told you need to start early because apparently I'm getting, I'm really excited about some of the research that is coming out around character. This is not work that I've ever done before. So I'm reading voraciously about, mm. about it. There's a group called the Character Lab. That's all they do is study character metrics. And so we're trying to understand what exactly are the indicators? And how do you even assess for this stuff? How do you know it's working? Yeah. You ask me that. I'll t invite me when, you know, in I'd 10 love years. It. It's fascinating. And yeah. we'll oh, no, no, see. we'll invite you before that. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see how it's going. What I know is we have to do something. Yeah. And, and part of um, my way of not sitting and being angry about mm. things and getting, and I am outraged. That's why I, I work on this, because it's outrageous. But, so then what am I going to do about it? Because mm. that's the way I was taught. You do, you get outreach, and then you say, okay, so then what are you going to do exactly. about it? Yeah. And this is what we're doing. And we are, we are testing a new model of, of doing things. And, and in Kenya, working with the Ministry of Education, fortunately for us in Kenya, life skills 
has been introduced into the new curriculum, the competency-based curriculum. So now it's about trying to see, can we ensure that the content that is delivered to children includes some of these relevant topics, mm. some of these concepts that have been tested by others. We're coming to it, but a lot of people have already worked on how important a growth mindset is and how you begin to unpack that for children yeah. and teachers and head teachers. And the more we do this work in schools, we're learning working with kids is not enough. You have to work with the teachers and then you have to work and with the, the parents head teachers, and yeah. the parents and the governors, <laughs> all of them and coach and mentor them all. And right. sometimes the children will do that for you. But it is what we call the school community. It's a, it's a wide, deep and mm. wide uh, group. Yeah. Very exciting to be, um, to be going into a field that is relatively new for you. Um, and that actually what, what I'm fascinated is that it came through an external report to you mm -hmm. and that you just recognized as being a, a pretty alarming x-ray of your country mm -hmm. um, and decided to do something about that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Because that, then that's the only way I could sleep. <laughs> we struggle understood. to sleep too. <laughs> understood, understood. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for l not stepping into your mother's shoes, but to living into her soul. Oh, thank you, Christiana. Thank you. You inspire me all the time. Thank you for all you've done. That was just wonderful to have the chance to sit down with Gwenjira. And I mean, apart from anything else, I am just delighted that we have decided to give the proceeds of our book from the pre-sale period to the Greenbelt movement, because what could be more important and more inspirational than Gwenjira and all the work going on in Kenya? Um, but what do you guys leave that conversation with? Well, first of all, buy the book because it, money goes towards her <laughs> incredibly good cause. Um, I, I think uh, it's incredibly astute uh, that she... Uh, identifies that corruption renders almost everything hopeless and useless in her words. And, you know, that 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 realisation is of, of huge importance because she also talked about how she saw sustainability as the interconnectedness of things, environment, democracy and peace. And I think this uh, relates a little bit to the discussion we were having uh, last week about uh, you know what we what we really need uh, to to solve these problems isn't isn't you know some kind of um, end of pipe technical solution to pollution that we actually have to look at the way our society is run and how we act in the best interests of each other so that holistic perspective I, I, I thought was absolutely key and um, you know her ability to 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 see how um, the broad acceptability of corruption is is it's like a disease that that overcomes society uh, and, and and trying to root that out at the core even even uh, uh, um, amongst children and and finally this notion of building a, a culture of purpose uh, fostering courageous leadership i absolutely believe that's true i think that that courage comes from the heart and 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 and, and is fueled by belief uh, and and that's that's a very inspiring image can i just come in on that because i think she also used the fantastic term courage deficit yeah and i thought that was such a fantastic concept right because we tend to think of courage as um as being something that we bring obviously in a moment in which we're challenged but to look at it the other way and say actually actually when you know when when the going gets really tough there is very often a courage deficit yeah it just puts it so squarely into what the problem is that it's the the courage is there it's to be had it's to be enacted it's to be brought to the table but if there's not a willingness and a commitment to actually dig in there and put it on the table precisely when these challenges are in front of us then there is a courage deficit totally and i and i agree with everything you said i think also and it's just a sort of small point in a way but you know, her spirit was so affecting. She's such an amazing human being. And there was a little thing that she said that just made me think, you know, I mean, the, being the daughter of such a powerful person that was so successful um, is obviously a huge privilege for her, but probably also could have been, you know, challenging in her life. And we all know people who've struggled with that sort of thing. But then when you asked her about, you know, standing in her shadow and she said, actually, I bask in her sunlight. Mm. You know, what an amazing, so beautiful. so beautiful. And what an amazing perspective that that has just become a wholly positive thing. Mm. And she just celebrates that memory yeah. and, and really honors it with her incredible work. Absolutely. 
And what was that last thing she said that I remember? Greta is galvanizing all of us, she said. She's not saying anything new, but she represents a force that will be impossible to subdue. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Hey, everyone. Clay here, producer. Thanks for listening to another episode of Outrage and Optimism. Christiana and Tom's new book, The Future We Choose, is available for pre-order online now. I've put a link in the show notes below, wechoosethefuture.com, so go check it out. Outrage and Optimism is a production of Global Optimism and is produced this week by Nolan Rossi. We have an amazing team that makes this happen. That team is Callum Grieve, Freya Newman, Pete Cluttenbrock, Chloe Revel, Marina Mancilla, Sarah Caduce Chevalier, Millie Timms, Heather Clark, Zoe Sherlock Antich, Nigel Topping, and Michael Northrup. You can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Global Optimism, and you can email us directly at podcast at globaloptimism.com. Please take a moment and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, click the stars, and write a review. It seriously makes a difference and it helps spread the word about the podcast. So thanks for doing that. Okay, that's everything. We will see you right here next week. 